2022. Euh, et comme vous le savez aussi, ce prix est destiné à honorer la mémoire de Abraham, Bloch et Brua, qui ont dirigé le laboratoire de physique de l'ENS entre 1912 et 1944, et euh, qui sont à l'origine du, du bâtiment dans lequel nous travaillons encore aujourd'hui. Euh, ils sont morts ensuite en déportation euh, au cours de la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Alors ce qu'on sait moins, c'est concerne l'œuvre scientifique de ces trois physiciens, probablement à cause du, du temps qui a passé, et c'est un peu regrettable. Ça serait bien d'y remédier à l'occasion, sous une forme ou une autre. D'une part, parce que la meilleure façon d'honorer les scientifiques est de rappeler euh, quelles ont été leurs contributions, mais aussi parce que certaines de leurs découvertes, en fait... Euh, ont abouti à des concepts qui sont encore d'actualité dans différents domaines de la physique ou dans des disciplines voisines de la physique. Voilà alors, aujourd'hui, après quelques perturbations dues aux années Covid, le prix des trois physiciens reprend son rythme normal d'un lauréat par an. Et nous avons le plaisir de remettre le prix des trois physiciens 2022 à Frédéric Chevy. Alors pour, je cite, des contributions très originales à la physique des fluides quantiques et classiques. Je voudrais juste dire un mot sur son activité d'enseignement. Car étant enseignant moi-même au département, j'ai eu le plaisir de collaborer avec lui pendant le quart de siècle précédent. Et comme l'ont noté plusieurs membres du jury du prix, c'est aussi en raison de son implication très forte à l'enseignement au département que le prix lui est décerné aujourd'hui. Alors je dois procéder à une simple opération administrative qui pendant longtemps a consisté à remettre un chèque et un diplôme. Or le chèque n'existe plus. Dame. <rire> Mais euh, je me suis que, que les futurs lauréats se rassurent. Le financement existe toujours. Simplement la Fondation de France s'étant modernisée. Euh, le financement est maintenant attribué suite à des opérations informatiques qui ont déjà nécessité plusieurs échanges de mails et une réunion Teams avec la Fondation de France. Et donc vous comprendrez que l'informatique a rendu les choses beaucoup moins efficaces et qu'au lieu d'avoir le chèque à présent, eh bien, tu auras euh, la somme d'argent correspondante qui arrivera éventuellement sur ton compte si tout va bien dans un avenir ultérieur. D'accord. Alors par contre, il y a, il y a aussi la, la deuxième opération est administrative et de remettre le diplôme. Donc celle-là est restée euh, analogique, si j'ose dire. Donc euh, j'ai le plaisir donc, de te remettre ce diplôme. Ah, merci. Alors euh, le cadre est neuf, tu pourras éventuellement l'utiliser ultérieurement pour des usages plus appropriés. Merci. Quand, quand je, on m'a annoncé le prix, j'ai d'abord été très honoré. Ensuite, je suis allé voir la liste des récipiendaires et là, tout d'un coup, j'étais très intimidé parce que la, la liste est, est très, très impressionnante. Et, et surtout parce que euh, finalement, comme tout travail, tout ce que euh, Gérald vient raconter, c'est avant tout un travail collectif euh, qui ne serait probablement pas possible autrement que dans un endroit aussi merveilleux que, que l'ENS. Donc, euh, comme Gérald l'a raconté, euh, je suis revenu ici, enfin, je n'étais pas très loin, j'étais au Collège de France il y a 20 ans exactement. Et, euh, et depuis, vraiment, ça a été euh, une, une époque extrêmement stimulante, à la fois sur les aspects quantiques, classiques, l'enseignement, etc. C'est vraiment un, un milieu unique. Euh, et donc, j'ai travaillé avec beaucoup, beaucoup d'entre vous dans cette salle, à la fois euh, scientifiquement, de, du point de vue de, avec l'enseignement, du point de l'organisation d'événements aussi. Euh, donc, je vais avoir du mal à, à tous vous, vous remercier. Et je m'excuse par avance de ne pas citer tout le monde. Euh, mais voilà, donc euh, 
il faut quand même que, que j'ai quand même sélectionné quelques, quelques personnes. La, la première personne, c'est vraiment Christophe. Euh, je voudrais vraiment te remercier parce que c'est toi qui m'as accueilli donc, il y a 20 ans maintenant, euh, quand je revenais du Collège de France. Et euh, vraiment, je ne pouvais pas imaginer euh, meilleure personne avec qui, avec qui travailler pendant ces 20, 20 années. Euh, ça a été vraiment une, une collaboration exceptionnelle. Bon, c'est parfait. Euh, c'est toujours de bonne humeur, toujours stimulant, des idées toujours très créatives. Donc merci beaucoup. Je pense que ce prix te doit beaucoup, 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 beaucoup. Euh, évidemment, ce travail, même, ce n'est pas uniquement celui de Christophe et moi, et, mais c'est aussi, surtout, en fait, celui de, de tous les doctorants qui alors, ont rejoint à un moment ou à un autre euh, notre groupe. Euh, vous avez ici, les, alors, je ne sais pas comment ça marche. Euh, en fait, on est passé en mode... Euh, en mode présentateur, je ne vois plus le, le pointeur. Bon, Donc vous avez toutes les générations de, de doctorants depuis 2003 jusqu'à jusqu aujourd'hui. Et, euh, et c'était vraiment des, tous étaient des, des étudiants exceptionnels qui nous ont... Euh, sans eux, on n'aurait pas probablement pas la, la stimulation euh, permanente pour essayer de trouver de nouvelles choses, d'avancer. Euh, évidemment, ils font beaucoup de travail, mais aussi, ils sont là aussi pour, pour nous stimuler, pour, pour euh, faire avancer la, la recherche. Donc euh, un grand merci à, à, à tous. Et en particulier la dernière génération qui est dans, dans le coin ici, euh, donc Arnaud, Lovro et, et, et Gentle. Euh, sur la photo, donc, il y a Christophe et puis il y a aussi Xavier. Donc merci aussi Xavier, euh, tu es un super co-bureau. On partage le même bureau depuis, euh, depuis quelques mois. Et euh, pareil, enfin, c'est une très très belle histoire euh, euh, à la fois humaine, euh, amicale et puis, euh, et puis scientifique. Alors évidemment, euh, voilà, ça c'est les gens qui, ont, qui, ont, qui, qui étaient dans le groupe. Il y a aussi tous les théoriciens avec lesquels on a, on a travaillé, tous les gens de mon ancienne existence, euh, de physiciens classiques avec qui j'ai pas coupé les ponts, David Kerry, Elie Raphaël, Christophe Clenet euh, et leurs étudiants. Et puis, comme, comme ça a été dit, la, la, la vie d'enseignant de, chercheur, c'est pas uniquement de la recherche, c'est aussi de, de l'enseignement. Donc, euh, merci à tous les enseignants avec lesquels j'ai pu, euh, pu travailler. Un grand merci aussi euh, aux personnels administratifs qui, qui nous soutiennent en permanence et qui nous permettent de faire de l'enseignement et de la recherche. Euh, donc, en particulier, toutes les, tous les gestionnaires de, de l'enseignement, euh, Camille, Médina, Marie et puis, et puis Sarah, euh, Laura aussi, que j'embête régulièrement. Et puis, et puis Christine, qui, qui m'a découvert récemment, et, et j'espère pas trop embêter. Euh, voilà, et puis comme je dis, euh, merci, euh, merci à vous tous de, de faire vivre ce, ce département, qui est vraiment un endroit unique dans, dans le monde, et je pense qu'il y en a peu euh, où on a une atmosphère de recherche aussi stimulante. Avant de, de passer en français, puis, euh, en anglais, pardon, et de passer à la partie scientifique, enfin, je voudrais dédier euh, ce, ce prix à mon père, euh, qui était aussi un physicien, euh, à SU, je ne sais pas s'il y en a qui, qui l'ont connu, enfin ça s'appelait l'UPMC à l'époque. Euh, il est décédé euh, cet été, enfin c était, c était en septembre. Hein. Euh, et euh, évidemment, comme, comme toute personne, on aimerait bien se dire qu'on est des self-made personnes qui se sont fait soi-même, euh, mais c'est évident que euh, bah, sans, sans son éducation euh, et sans tout ce qu'il a pu m'apporter, euh, bah, je ne serais probablement pas là devant vous avec euh, ce prix. Voilà, donc euh, je voulais lui dédier ce, ce prix tout particulièrement. Okay, so uh, now I will switch to English and uh, to the, the main topic of, uh, of the talk. And so, uh, as uh, Gérald explained to you, I'm going to be telling you about uh, cold atoms. And so, just in case someone, some of you may not have uh, already visited a cold atom experiment, uh, this is essentially what it looks like. Uh, so, there are lots of uh, mirrors, lots of cables, uh, a few students working there. And uh, with these mirrors and these, um, these, uh, these lasers, uh, we can manipulate and cool atoms to very, very low temperature. So what do we mean by very, very low temperature? You see that the, the, um, the, the, the meaning of this statement is not as obvious as, as you may seem. So just to give you a few numbers, uh, so you must imagine that at the middle of this uh, apparatus, there is a small cell, usually a glass cell, And in that cell, there is a small cloud containing about a few thousands or a few tens of thousands of atoms. Uh, the size is mesoscopic, so a few tens or a few hundred micrometers, so something you could barely see by the naked eye. And uh, using uh, cooling techniques, we can reach the lowest temperature or energies, depending on whether you want to, to define it properly, uh, achievable in the world and also in the universe. We, we don't know any other place in the universe which are uh, colder than the cold atom experiments. Uh, and so the, the record, at least last time I checked, was uh, achieved uh, in uh, 
two or three years ago, uh, and a few uh, tens of picokelvins. Okay, so in absolute value, few picokelvins is very, very small. But actually, in terms of many body physics, because in the end, we, we do not try to call the atoms uh, just to be the, the coldest place in the universe. Uh, the, the, the point is to reach a regime where quantum mechanics uh, dominates the, um, the uh, macroscopic or collective behavior of the particles. And uh, here, the, uh, the coldness of our samples is not so, uh, so obvious. Because Obviously, an absolute temperature is meaningless. You have to compare it to something else. And if you consider, I guess, the fermions, because I will mostly tell you about the fermions, the um, relevant uh, temperature scale is the Fermi temperature. And the Fermi temperature, if you remember your uh, textbooks in, uh, of physics, scales like essentially uh, h bar square times the density to third divided by the mass. So if you want to have a high Fermi temperature so that it's easy to reach a quantum regime, you need to work with high density and, and low mass. And so it's interesting to compare what happens uh, with cold atoms and with uh, electrons in metals. So in cold atoms, we have very low densities uh, because we are dealing with gases. And the densities correspond to 10 to the 30, uh, 10 to the 20, sorry, sorry uh, particle per, uh, per meter cubes. Uh, by contrast, with the electrons, you have about one electron per, uh, per angstrom, so that corresponds to a density of 10 to the 30 uh, electrons per meter cube. So you see that the density of electrons in the metal is much higher than uh, for ultra-cold atoms. Now, if I look at the mass, the mass of an electron is 10 to the 30 uh, kilograms, uh, while the uh, mass of an atom is a few uh, atomic unit masses, so 10 to minus 27, 10 to minus 26, something like this. So that's heavier, obviously, than electrons. So you see that in terms of Fermi temperature, it's more favorable to uh, work with electrons than to work with, uh, with, uh, with atoms. If I calculate some order of magnitude for the uh, Fermi temperature of a glass cast of electrons in, in a metal, you have a Fermi temperature which is about 10 to the 5, so 100,000 uh, Kelvin, which means that at room temperature you're already in the, um, in the, uh, in the quantum regime. Uh, on the con on, by contrast, if I now consider cold atoms, if it, I, I compute the, uh, the Fermi temperature, it's more in the uh, micro Kelvin, 100 and nano Kelvin ra uh, range. So you see that it's much more challenging to reach a quantum regime with cold atoms than with, uh, with electrons. And, uh, and actually, so, so when, we, when we're talking about very low temperature, like nano Kelvin uh, temperature, that corresponds to TRTF, which are something like a percent, uh, which is not so impressive if you compare to what uh, people can do with just standard cryogenic techniques where uh, they can cool down samples to the Kelvin or even millikelvin range. And so the, uh, the real power uh, of cold atoms is not uh, really by the absolute temperature that we reach. The real power of cold atoms is really the flexibility of the experimental uh, environment in which our particles uh, actually live. Uh, because by using light and using magnetic field, we can very easily uh, tailor, engineer some very specific uh, environment, just by, almost by the snap of the finger. Uh, in the sense that, uh, for instance, we can, uh, uh, we can create potentials which are directly proportional to the intensity of the light that is shined on, on the atoms. And using some uh, devices analogous to the ones which are uh, in, uh, in beamers, like, like this one, we can modulate this intensity. And so in instantaneously, uh, just by reprogramming a computer, we can change the environment or the potential in which lives the uh, atoms without, without having to, for instance, redo uh, a sample uh, in a clean room, just like you would have in, um, in solid state physics. And so this uh, gives a very high flexibility in the number of, uh, of uh, problems that can be addressed using cold atoms, even with a single uh, experimental apparatus. So I just give here uh, a few examples. So there are lots of them that the committee is very, very broad and, and they are uh, doing a tremendous job. Um, and so, uh, so how does it work here? Oh, this was so here, uh, so these are experiments uh, 
that we, that we perform where we can actually change the strength of the interaction just by changing the magnetic field. So you just have to change the value of the magnetic field and you can tune, I, I will show you that later, the strength of interaction from non-interacting to strongly interacting, uh, attractive, repulsive, etc., whatever you want. And for, and for instance, using the magic of uh, scaling laws, uh, we could, uh, in a cold atom experiment, measure the equation of state of a, a neutron star. So these objects, which are very far away, very dense, very hot, actually share the same equation of state as uh, our very dilute and very cold systems. And by doing, performing uh, experiments in the lab using cold atoms, we could get some insights on the properties of, uh, of uh, neutron stars. Another example is this one here. Uh, the fact that uh, you can create some uh, periodic potentials here, uh, so what we call optical lattices, just by interfering several laser beams, and uh, trap the atoms inside this, uh, this potential, so to create some kind of artificial uh, lattice or crystal uh, of atoms. And now, with the development of uh, high-resolution imaging, it's possible to uh, observe the atoms one by one uh, using what is now called the uh, quantum gas microscope. And so this is a realization of what is called the Hubbard model. So for those of you who are familiar with this model, it's one of the uh, favorite models from people doing uh, many body physics uh, uh, in theory. What is really nice also is that you can manipulate these atoms individually. So you can put them wherever you want using some tweezers. And for instance, the group of, uh, of um, uh, Anton Bress at um, at Sidoptique uh, in Palaiso, uh, became a specialist of uh, this kind of uh, tweezer. So uh, Michel Brun also has the same kind of uh, experiment here. And so you can move around these, these atoms. Uh, and for instance, here you have uh, atoms arranged, uh, organized according an Eiffel Tower. So and a bit less uh, anecdotically, let's say, uh, they could, for instance, realize some kind of uh, so the so-called SSH models, so it's some kind of lattice models, uh, which has some peculiar uh, topological properties. And so that's really what I want, would like to stress here, is that the, the real power of uh, ultra-cold atom is not the absolute temperature that we can reach, but really this flexibility that is given to us by the fact that atoms are complex objects and they have lots of internal degrees of freedom that allow us to really uh, put them in some very, very diverse environments and physical situations. So that's essentially my, my take home message for, for this. So uh, the, the experiment I would like to, to tell you was performed with, uh, with lithium. And so lithium is a very nice atom uh, because it has two stable isotopes, uh, lithium-6 and lithium-7, and which happen to be for lithium-7 a boson and for lithium-6 a fermion. So that means that in a single uh, apparatus, you have access to the physics of bosonic particles and fermionic particles. So here you see two pictures of uh, our cloud. Uh, so here are the bosons. You see that uh, it's a low temperature and uh, the presence of a boson chain condensate is herald heralded by the presence of this narrow peak at the center, which corresponds to the, the, the atoms which are condensed uh, in their ground state. And uh, so th these two pictures correspond to atoms which are in the same trap at same temperature, uh, taken at the same moment. They were just shifted just for clarity so that you could see uh, what's going on in the, uh, the lower uh, cloud corresponds to uh, fermions, so at same temperature, so they obviously do not condense. When I say obviously, it's not so obvious, actually, you will see later. Um, but yeah, so fermions, uh, they, they do not form this uh, very narrow peak corresponding to the bose chain condensate. And uh, here, what I would like to, to tell you about is more, is about impurity physics. So impurity physics is a very generic problem in, in physics, quantum or not quantum, uh, that happens when you have some medium and you put an object uh, inside this medium. And you would like to see how the properties of this uh, object are modified by the interaction with the medium. Um, without, probably without over-exaggerating, over this is probably one of the first things that you learn when you learn science in, uh, in uh, elementary school. Because one of the first, first exercises that uh, teachers ask you to do is to uh, sort materials depending on whether they float or not on water. Uh, does it sink? Does it float? And this is exactly the kind of uh, situation I'm, uh, I would like to deal with. So if you, uh, sorry. Uh, um, so if you, uh, wh what happens, how can I describe this very famous Archimedes law? Is that when I put an object in water, 
its mass, its gravitational mass is modified because I have to uh, subtract the, uh, the the mass of the the liquid which is um, which is uh, displaced by the uh, by the object. And so, in some sense, if you float on top of water, it's because your gravitational your effective gravitational mass became negative, and that's why gravity pulls you upwards instead of downwards. So, when you put an object in a medium, first thing, its mass is modified. So here is just a static uh, phenomenon, but you could also imagine some other modification of its properties, uh, which are due to dynamic uh, effects. And um, so there's obviously the, the viscous drag that we all know about. When you try to move inside water, you have to, to pull the, 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 the molecules of water which are in front of you. And so that's created drag. But there are some less, uh, more subtle uh, phenomena occurring. And there is a very spectacular way of illustrating this on this, uh, on this movie here. So let's see if the movie starts. Can it start? Yes. So it's a uh, swimming competition. And I would like you to sh follow what's going on in this line here. So they're ready to start. Ready, steady, go. So this guy is here. And you see it's staying underwater. Still underwater. Still underwater. Still. Yeah, it's a fish. No, it's probably human. Still in the water. And it's way, 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 way ahead of the other, of his opponents. <laughs> and he wins. OK, what happened here? Uh, obviously, the drag on the guy swimming underwater was much lower than the drag of the people swimming at the top of the surface of the water. And wha what's the difference? The difference is that when you uh, move at the surface of water, you create waves. And creating waves, creating wake, uh, costs you energy. When, while when you are uh, underwater, uh, obviously you do not create waves. And so this additional cost, energy cost, is really significant. If you look at boats, ships, for instance, this so-called wave drag uh, is about one third of the total drag of the, uh, of the ship. And so uh, the, 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 the message here is that when you move in, a, in an object, in a, in a medium, you can create excitations in this, uh, in this medium. So here it's a surface wave, but it can be sound waves, it can be any uh, electromagnetic wave, in, for instance, in Cherenkov radiation. And uh, these, uh, these, uh, the, the, this cloud of excitations that you create in the medium will alter, alter also your, the property of your particles. And so this is uh, these, uh, this phenomena that I illustrate here in a very dramatic manner in the macros macroscopic world that I would like to transpose to the quantum uh, realm. So let's consider some particles. So it can be an atom, an electron, whatever. Uh, first in vacuum. And so if I look at uh, its dispersion relation, its momentum is conserved, and its dispersion relation will be just some rest mass, so mc squared, uh, plus some kinetic energy. So here I'm dealing with just very cold particles or very slow particles, so uh, no uh, relativistic corrections. So just p squared divided by 2m. And so now if I put this particle in, uh, in some medium, essentially you will get the same kind of phenomenology. So your, your uh, particle will keep its uh, particle nature except that uh, its dispersion relation will be uh, altered by the interaction with the medium. So it will create some excitation in the medium. Uh, this excitation will create uh, a cloud of excitations around the, the, the quasi-particle. And these, um, these excitations will modify the uh, parameters, the effective parameters, describing the dispersion relation of the, uh, of the particle. So now uh, you will have a... Um, uh, uh, mass energy which will be modified by the interaction with the, uh, with the medium and an effective mass which will also be uh, modified by the interaction with the medium. And just I, I've shown you that this is a very generic scenario that exists also in, in, ma in macroscopic physics but as I said it's also very generic in microscopic physics and it was actually uh, this Quasi-particle concept was actually invented for the first time by Landau and Picard in the middle of the 20th century. And at the time, they were looking at the uh, interactions between electrons and the excitation of the lattice. So what happens when you move an electron in the lattice? So it will polarize locally the, uh, the lattice uh, and will create some sound waves, some phonons. And so the electrons will move surrounded by a, a cloud of, uh, of phonons. And so they call that the, the Poron problem, so uh, Landau and, and Picard. 
And uh, the interest for, for this problem was uh, revived very recently, uh, like past decade or so, uh, because the, the Poron properties are very important to the uh, for the transport of charge and the conversion of uh, energy uh, into charge in uh, photovoltaic materials. And so for the development of uh, optimized uh, solar panels, uh, it's very important to, to understand the properties of these, uh, of these Poron uh, objects. Uh, another uh, iconic example of these quasi-particles is the, uh, the Higgs mechanism or the Meissner effect, uh, depending on which uh, community you belong. Uh, so the, 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 the you know that the, the Higgs mechanism explains how some particles uh, gain their mass by coupling uh, to the Higgs field. So once again, you, you have a particle moving in the vacuum of the Higgs field, and by uh, dressing with the, uh, with the excitation of the Higgs field, it provides some the, the, the mass of that particles. And you have the same uh, phenomenon in, uh, in uh, superconductivity. Uh, when a photon propagates inside the superconductors, it dresses with uh, the excitations of the superconductors that gives uh, the photon a mass. And this is this mass that prevents the photon from penetrating uh, a superconductor and is at the origin of the, um, of the Meissner effect. Okay, so that's a very generic problem with uh, lots of application to lots of uh, different fields. And so uh, we uh, wanted uh, to, to look at this problem in the, uh, in the realm of, of atomic physics. And here, the, the really nice thing that due to the very high flexibility uh, of our systems, we can change the nature of the environment in which the, uh, the particle evolves. So uh, you will see, we will explore different kind of environments and see how the properties of the um, of the uh, of the impurity changes uh, depending on the nature of this uh, of the environment. Okay, so the first example I would like to discuss is what happens uh, to to uh, continue on the simile of uh, of a particle moving in water. Uh, what happens is the Fermi C. So if you always wanted to know where the Fermi C is, it's here. It's on this map. I found it somewhere in my attic. It's a very secret map. Uh, actually, it's a very special Fermi C we'll be dealing with here uh, because we uh, consider so an impurity. So in our case, that would be uh, that correspond to uh, two spins, two spin states of lithium six, so the Fermi Fermi isotope, and so we mostly populate, let's say, the spin up. Uh, so we have lots of spin up, and we pu put a few spin down uh, lithium six inside the uh, the Fermi C. Uh, and so the, the spin down will play the role of uh, of impurities. Uh, and so what is uh, important here is that uh, we are dealing with, again, with cold atoms. And uh, cold atoms are characterized by the fact that the double wavelength is much larger than the range of the potential. So which means that in our experiment, we can uh, assume that the, the range are essentially, uh, the interactions are actually uh, zero range interactions or contact interactions. And which means that when you have uh, two particles which have uh, spin up and are fermions, uh, they cannot be at the same place, and so they cannot interact through contact interactions. And so if you consider a gas of spin-polarized fermions, this is essentially an ideal gas of fermions. So the problem that we'll uh, be looking at now is the problem of an impurity immersed in a Fermi C, an ideal Fermi C of fermions. So what happens in this case? So you have your Fermi C here. Uh, you have the impurity which is there, and so uh, if I uh, turn on the interaction between the impurity and uh, the fermions, uh, the excitation we can be create that can be created, the only excitation that exists in this case, are just particle hole excitations. So that will create a hole in the particle. So it can create several particle holes, actually. Uh, but what is remarkable here is that even when the uh, impurity is strongly interacting with the uh, ideal Fermi gas, if you assume that there's only one particle hole uh, excitation, it's enough to uh, get a very, very good uh, quantitative agreement with, uh, with experiments and also uh, exact calculations that uh, Monte Carlo simulation, for instance, that take into account the, any an arbitrary number of particle hole excitations in the cloud surrounding the, the quasi-particles. So for instance, uh, in theory, at least using this idea, uh, you can calculate the effective mass, the energy, etc. So here is several plots depending on the mass ratio between the um, the, 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 the impurity and the, uh, and the fermions. And as I said, so this situation can be realized experimentally. And so we can measure these quantities. We can measure the effective mass. We can measure the energy of the, um, the quasi-particle. 
So how do we do that? So to measure the energy of the quasi-particle, what we do, uh, or what was done here in the group of uh, Martin Zierlein at MIT, uh, is to perform some radio frequency spectroscopy of the, of the cloud. So the, the idea is very simple. Uh, so here you have actually three spin states of, uh, of lithium. So the, the, the state, what I call state one and two, are the one I was describing before. So this is our Fermi C, these are the impurities. And what you do is that you will uh, transfer the atoms from state two to state three using just some, uh, some light, so radio frequency field. And uh, since the particle in state two and state three do not have the same kind of interaction with particles in state one, uh, there will be a shift uh, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, resonance, uh, absorption resonance, due to the interactions of particle two in with, uh, with uh, particle one. So the, the, the absorption line uh, will be just shifted by the uh, interactions, uh, the energy, uh, interaction energy of the, of the polar arm. And so this is what they measured. Uh, so this is the position of the peak in units of epsilon f. So here, this is a measurement of the uh, interaction strength. So I didn't mention that, but uh, so kf is obviously the, the Fermi wave vector. A is what is called the scattering length. So the scattering length is just the length that measures the, uh, the strength of the, uh, of the interactions. When A is positive and small, you have essentially uh, weakly repulsive interaction. When A is negative and small, you have weakly attractive interactions. And uh, you, uh, when A is infinite, you have a strongly attractive strongly interacting systems. But whatever, so here you measure the, uh, the interaction strength between the, the, the particles, between the impurity and the, and the fermions. And so, uh, let me remember, uh, the, the blue points correspond to the measurements. Uh, the uh, diamonds here correspond to the uh, prediction from Monte Carlo simulations. The dashed line it corresponds to the, uh, the, the uh, model where you just consider one particle hole in the, uh, the cloud dressing the impurity, and the solid line corresponds uh, to the situation where you also take into account the fact that particles in state three also have a small interaction with particles in state one. And so you see that first there is a very good agreement between uh, the Monte Carlo simulation and the uh, simple model where you just have one uh, particle hole excitations, and there's also a very good agreement uh, between the um, the, uh, the theory in the experiment. So uh, as I said, we can measure so the interaction energy, so this E0, the in inter interaction energy uh, of the impurity with the, uh, with the uh, Fermi C. Now the effective mass, so it was measured in our group. And so here to measure the effective mass, what we did was to uh, just excite the breathing mode of the cloud. So we compress the, the, the trap in which the atoms uh, live. And so the, the atoms start to, to breathe. And we measured the uh, oscillation frequency uh, of the impurities, of the cloud of impurities inside the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the cloud of fermions. And so what we see is that there are two frequencies. So if you uh, make a, uh, a Fourier analysis of the of the oscillations, you have two peaks. And so one peak corresponds to essentially an in-phase oscillation of both the, uh, the, the, the medium and the impurities, so they oscillate in phase. And there is uh, an, uh, an oscillation out of phase, which corresponds essentially since the, uh, there, there's a very, very big cloud of fermions, the, the fermions are uh, immobile, and uh, the, um, the impurity just oscillates on their own. And uh, this, uh, this frequency, so here we measured it at the function of the polarization. So the, here it's a fully polarized system. So that's the, the limit where there are just uh, very few impurities. So that's what we are aiming at. And so you can write this uh, frequency at the square root of some uh, restraining force divided by some, some divided by some effective mass. And this way, you can recover the effective mass. And you see that the effective mass in units of the uh, bare mass is equal to 1.17. So it's very close to, um, to the, uh, the, the, the mass of the bare mass for scattering length, which is infinite. So something, a system which is infinitely strongly uh, interacting. So even in the region of very strong interactions, uh, the effective mass remains pretty close to the, uh, to the bare mass. So um, that's, well, there were lots of other things done on this uh, fermi polarum problem, but I would like now to, to switch to the uh, second problem, which is the bose polarum So bose polarons uh, is here, so it's a bose ocean And you will see that the, the waters of the bose ocean are very treacherous. So 
here we're dealing with a boson chain condensate. So it's a very old boson chain condensate from 1997 and the first experiments from uh, Ketterle, Weinmann, and, and Cornell. And once again, you put an impurity uh, inside this uh, boson chain condensate. So we didn't do these experiments, so I will describe experiments from other groups. But that we could do that because we have bosons and we could put impurity in this bose gas. That wouldn't be a problem. And so here it's very easy because the Bose gas is weakly interacting. So there are some interactions here. And these interactions create some sound waves. This is the low energy waves, uh, low energy excitations of essentially any interacting systems. And uh, when you put the impurity, it will just create sound waves. So this is very close to what uh, Landau and Picard were describing, uh, where they were looking at the sound waves in a crystal. Here's the sound wave of Bose and Chancompsate. So in that respect, that's a very simple uh, problem that's described at the Hamilton, which is the Foley Hamiltonian that's known since the 50s. But there is a uh, caveat here is that um, the, that kind of system is actually unstable for strong interaction. I, I I've shown you that uh, we could take our impurity in the Fermi C and crank up the strength of the interaction between the impurity and the, and the Fermi to infinity, and there was no problem. We could measure an effective mass, which is actually very close to one. There, there's no, no problem here. Uh, but you can prove, actually, that for bosons, that's different. Because there's a, a singularity in the three-body problem, uh, which is called the Efimov effect, that leads to a formation of very peculiar uh, trimer states, uh, which is called the Efimov trimer, so I don't have time to, uh, to, uh, to go into the details. But what you just need to know is that uh, these Efimov trimers are objects that three-body bound state that exists even if when there is no two-body bound states. So that's, well, that's why they're also called the Borromean uh, trimers. And they were studied for the first time by uh, Efimov uh, in 19 in a paper uh, from 1971. So he was looking at uh, nuclear physics. Uh, but they were observed only for the first time in cold atoms, so ensemble of uh, strongly interacting bosons by the group of, of Rudy Grimm, so in 2006. And, and so these, unfortunately, these, uh, these trimers uh, will lead to uh, what we call three-body recombination, so some kind of uh, inelastic process in cold atoms uh, that leads to, the, to heating and loss in our, in our systems. So it's a... The, 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 the Bose problem is a more uh, sensitive, let's say, problem if you want to increase the strength of the interactions between the impurity and the, and the bosons. But nevertheless, uh, some people managed to, uh, to measure on the fly uh, the, uh, the, the Poron problem. So they did essentially the opposite of what uh, Martin Zierland did. So they started with uh, bosons, an impurity in a weakly interacting state, and brought, using radio frequency spectroscopy, the bosons in the uh, strongly interacting uh, regime. And so they could look at, uh, at the uh, resonance frequencies this way. And so, well, you, you, you here have uh, some, uh, some spectrum. So here, again, you did tuning as a function of the strength of interaction. So here you see you have resonances. Uh, so this is experiment. This is the theory. And well, experiment and theory look like a s looks the same, essentially, here and there. And if you want to go more into the details, so the, here are the plots uh, with the, uh, the, the dots corresponding to the experiment. The dashed line corresponds to a theory where you just put two-body physics. And as I told you, three-body physics is important in this system because of this Efimov uh, mechanism. And uh, now some theoreticians managed to uh, include three-body physics in, the, uh, in their calculation. And they got the, the blue lines that uh, coincide much better with the, uh, with the experiment. So you see that you have a very different phenomenology here, which is strongly affected by this Efimov physics uh, when you're dealing with, uh, with, uh, with bosons. And now, uh, as you saw maybe on the, on the map, there's a strait here that connects the two Cs. And there's actually a way, experimentally, to uh, interpolate between the Bose and, uh, and the Fermi, uh, Fermi poron. So I call this the BC to BCS trait. Uh, BC meaning bose condensate, and BCS meaning uh, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer. OK, so how can we interpolate in between things which are so different, uh, which are the, the fermions and, and the bosons? Uh, it's an idea that was uh, proposed in the, sorry, in the, uh, in the 80s by uh, Leggett, Nozier, Schmittrink. And at the time, they were asking themselves, uh, what is the relationship between uh, bose chain condensation and uh, superconductivity? Usually, usually in uh, introductory courses on, on, 
or on superconductivity, what people say is that, okay, I have electrons, uh, because of interaction with fermions, with phonons, sorry, uh, they have attractive uh, interactions, they, they form pairs, which are Cooper pairs. Uh, since these pairs are made of uh, two particles spin one half, they, have, they are uh, integer spin objects, so they are bosons, and so they form a boson chain condensate. And so that's essentially the, 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 uh, the, the story that we, that we tell uh, when, you want to, when you want to give us some simple explanation of what is superconductivity. But actually what uh, legat nozier schmidt ring showed is that the story is a bit more complex than that, and that uh, both anti condensation and the BCS theory of superconductivity are indeed uh, connected, but they are not exactly the same. They're actually the two limited cases of a single scenario, single model, uh, which is now called the BEC to BCS crossover. So how does this uh, scenario work? So I I imagine that you have an ensemble of spin 1F fermions, and they have attractive interactions. So uh, let's start with a very, very strongly attractive interaction. So these, uh, these fermions will attract each other and they will form uh, dimers, molecules if you want. Uh, so in our case, that would be lithium-2 molecules. And uh, if the size of the molecule is very small, so if you, or if you prefer the uh, binding energy of the molecule is very strong, uh, th there's a uh, limit where the, the size of the molecule is much smaller than uh, all the other uh, length scales of the problem, in particular the distance between the molecules. And so in this case, I can consider that I have a real gas of molecules, and these molecules are so strongly bound that they are uh, unbreakable, essentially. And so I can consider them as elementary objects of my theory. And these molecules are indeed bosons, and my, problem, my system is indeed described uh, by a boson chain condensate of molecule. And if you think a little, this is actually the generic scenario for boson chain condensation. Uh, because all the examples of boson chain condensate that we have in the lab, whether it's a helium-4 or a boson chain condensate of cold atoms or polar returns or whatever, uh, they are all composite objects. Helium-4 is not a fundamental particle of the standard model. It's made of uh, electrons, protons, neutrons, which are all fermions, which are strongly bound together. And, and so this is essentially what we have here. So uh, the, what would correspond to the, uh, the, the uh, binding energy of my molecule in, in the case of uh, helium-4 would be the ionization uh, energy of helium-4, the, the energy cost to remove on one electron from, uh, from the helium atom. Now let's assume that uh, we can change the uh, interaction strength, uh, between, uh, the strength of the interaction between the, between the particles. And we reduce progressively the interaction strength. At some point, you can show in 3D that the, uh, the, the potential will be too weak uh, to, uh, to maintain a bound state. Just because uh, you, when you want to, to form a bound state, you need to put particles within some distance. And because of Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle, this will create some uh, fluctuation of momentum. And this fluctuation of, uh, of momentum will be enough to break uh, the molecule if the, uh, the, the depth of the potential is just too small. And so you don't have any more any bound state, any two-body bound state in, in your system. But we know, nevertheless, from the BCS theory that even for arbitrarily uh, weakly attractive uh, fermions, they can form Cooper pairs. And the origin of these Cooper pairs is the fact that uh, they're not alone. The, the two fermions that you, you want to, to, to bind are not alone. They're in the presence of the Fermi C uh, of the other uh, electrons, for, for electrons in the metals. And these, uh, these electrons block a big chunk of the, uh, of the momentum space, just by Pauli principle. And so as I said, the, the fact that you break the, the molecules is due to the momentum fluctuations induced by uh, Heisenberg and certainty principle. But here you see that the Fermi C kind of suppress uh, these fluctuations and stabilizes the, uh, the pairs. And so this is the origin of the Cooper pairs. The origin of Cooper pairs is not a uh, two-body uh, binding, uh, just like for molecules, it's an uh, intrinsically many-body effect that involves the presence of the whole uh, Fermi C. And so uh, they develop a whole theory uh, that, um, that connects uh, somehow the, um, the BCS theory and the boson chain conversations of bosons. So this, uh, this was just a model in the 80s, and we had to wait until the early uh, 2000s and cold atom experiments, once again, to test and verify this scenario. 
uh, by using the fact that we can change the strength of interactions uh, in our atoms, uh, we could explore the whole crossover, so going from weakly at attractive to uh, strongly attractive uh, by varying the scattering length. Uh, so again, the, the, the scattering length here is on the, uh, on the uh, horizontal axis here. And we could explore the, the crossover uh, between so the, uh, the BCS uh, regime that corresponds to weakly attractive system to the BEC regime where we have a strongly attractive system. And in the middle, we have this unitary limits uh, regime where we have strong correlations. And when I told you about the uh, neutron star experiment, uh, this corresponds to this unitary limit. So the, this regime here, right in between the uh, weakly attractive and strongly attractive uh, regimes. Okay, and so now, um, as I said, we have fermions. We can put two spin states on our fermions. We can create these BCBCS uh, crossover superfluid, and now we can put a, um, an impurity uh, inside. And so we see that the, 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 um, the phase space will be pretty, uh, pretty rich. So something we have to, you have to know is that so um, here you see that the strongly attractive regime uh, is here. So that's where you have a bound state, a two-body bound state, and this two-body bound state exists only when A is positive. So it exists only here. Just have to remember that there's, uh, there's a, the, a threshold above which uh, you have a bound state and below which you don't have a bound state. Okay, so uh, now let's try to uh, imagine what could be the, uh, the phase diagram of our uh, poron problem. So I have a, a superfluid, so it's made of Cooper pairs, a molecule, whatever, so I have pairs. And I put my impurity, and so the, the simplest uh, situation I can imagine that there's very weak interaction between uh, the impurity and uh, the Cooper pair. So still have the quasi-particle, which is beha still behave as a single particle, and let's call this the, uh, the pore one. So it's very similar to what we had before. Now, uh, if uh, I have attractive interactions, because atoms have attractive interactions, I actually have a competition between the pollen, the impurity that wants to bind with one of the fermions, and the binding, the Cooper pairing, between two fermions. And so if the attraction, so if I vary here, the interaction between the impurity and the fermions, if the, so here I have a strongly attractive regime, is the, uh, the, uh, the attraction is too strong, what happens is that the impurity will uh, tear apart one of the molecules, take a fermion and form a second molecule made of one fermion, let's say spin up, and, uh, and an impurity. So I have a second branch, uh, which is made of uh, a molecule made of an impurity and a fermion immersed uh, in a uh, Cooper. And I still have one, uh, one lonely uh, spin, uh, spin down particle, but essentially there is this, uh, this, uh, this molecule here. And finally, I told you that, uh, if, yes. Oh, it's just energy, sorry. Synergy, yes, I forgot to mention. And uh, so let's call this a dimer. So a dimer immersed in a, in a superfluid of Cooper pairs or molecules. And finally, I told you that in this problem, when I have uh, boson, actually it's true when I have three different species of, of particles, I can have these Efimov trimers. And so I have a third branch here that would correspond to the fact that uh, due to this Efimov uh, mechanism, Actually, one pair, one Cooper pair, can attract a, uh, the impurity and form one of these Efimov trimers. And so I have a third state, which is co which we call the uh, trimeron or Efimov trimeron, uh, which has this kind of dispersion relation here, that corresponds to this uh, the formation of this Efimov uh, particle. So here I was varying the interaction between the impurity and the fermions. I can also vary the, uh, the interaction between the fermions themselves. And so I have a two-dimensional uh, phase diagram that looks like this. So this is, uh, this is a work of Xavier, actually. Uh, so here you vary the, uh, the, 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 st the strengths, the interactions between the fermions. So here I have the BCS limit. So I have a, a, some kind of superconductor or condensate of Cooper pairs. Here are my, have my molecules, deeply bound molecules of fermions, and here I vary the strength of the interaction between the impurity and the fermion. So here I have a weakly attractive uh, impurity, and there I have a strongly attractive uh, impurity. And so you see that we have three phases, the poron phase, the trimeron phase, and the dimeron phase that lives in these diagrams here. And what is really uh, interesting here is that uh, if you move along this uh, axis here, you, uh, you actually 
interpolate between uh, an ideal gas of fermions, because here my fermions are very weakly interacting, so uh, I have essentially an ideal gas of fermions, so I have something which is very close to the Fermi polar one, except that now I have two spin states, but uh, this is very close to the Fermi polar one. And there, as I said, you form molecules, and these molecules are bosons, and so you have a, a both polar one. So this, uh, this uh, system allows you to interpolate between the, uh, the Fermi polar one and the, uh, and the both polar one. Actually, we can do the, the experiment, as I said. So what you can do is to uh, take a, uh, a Fermi superfluid, so uh, of lithium-6, and put uh, some impurities. So here it was bosonic impurities of lithium-7 inside your superfluid of, uh, of lithium-6. Uh, of lithium six. And the experiment that we did uh, was to look at the dynamics of this mixture. So they, they live in the same trap, actually. They, they feel exactly the same potential. Uh, it's an optical trap, and uh, it's almost a harmonic trap. And so what we did was we have the, these two species, and we move them uh, out of the center. So they start to oscillate in the, in the cloud, like this. And you see that, so this is, again, the, uh, the, the, the oscillations of the, uh, so here you have time, here you have position, uh, the oscillation of the fermions, here are the oscillation of the bosons. And so you see that, uh, after a few oscillations, they, they, they're getting out of phase. So this is pretty simple to understand. It's because we're using lithium-6 and lithium-7. They have slightly different masses. And in a harmonic oscillator, the uh, frequency is called of k divided by m. So if you change the mass, you change the frequency. And so if you measure the frequencies of these two uh, species independently, so you perform one experiment with lithium-6, one experiment with lithium-7, and you measure the frequencies, this is what you get. 16.80 uh, hertz for lithium-6. 15.27 for lithium-7, and which is exactly in the ratio uh, 7 divided by 6 square roots that you expect due to the uh, mass ratio. So this was the experiment where you have just lithium-6 or lithium-7. So now if you perform the experiment when they're both together, and you measure once again the, the frequencies. Ooh. OK, it almost worked. <laughs> Uh, so the frequency of lithium-6 is almost not affected, which is normal because, as you can see, the, the cloud of lithium-6 is much bigger than the cloud of lithium-7, so there are very few uh, lithium-7 to affect lithium-6, so there's no change. But there's a small shift, of downward shift, of the frequency of the uh, lithium-7, uh, lithium and which is uh, significant because you see that the R-bar is just on the, on the second digit here. And so this shift of the frequency is a, a consequence of the interaction between the impurity and, uh, and its environment. So if you, okay, it's a, it's a bit small, but if you look at the scattering length of the different species, um, so here you have a magnetic field that allows us to change the scattering length. Here is the value of A in Bohr radii. The red uh, line here, corresponds to the uh, scaling length for the fermions. So it's the one that we tune to, to go uh, across the BC to BCS crossover. And it's actually a fermion divided by 100. So it's very, very, very big. So the, the fermions are very, very, very strongly interacting here. And the, the interaction between the, the bosons and fermions, the dashed line here, it's 40 ball radii, so it's much smaller and it's pretty constant. And so the, uh, the, 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 the consequence is that we can consider that the impurity are weakly coupled to this very, very strongly interacting gas of fermions. And so that will allow us to make a very simple model to uh, understand what's going on here. So we'll just give you the, the few, uh, few elements on how to, to, to calculate the, the frequency shift. So what's it's simply to say that uh, when I look at the, the, the bosons, so the lithium-7 atoms, they live in an effective potential, which is a sum of the trapping potential, uh, V of R, plus some interaction between the uh, fermions and the bosons. And these, uh, this interaction is just some coupling constant in a mean field uh, approximation, just proportional to the density of lithium-6 times the coupling constant. And you can show that this coupling constant is just proportional to the scattering length between the two species. So you have this potential here. And so the fact that uh, your potential is not uh, homogeneous creates also a curvature of this uh, mean field interaction here. So you can calculate the, the chemical potential of uh, lithium-6 using a so-called local density approximation, so saying that uh, the system is locally stable. I don't want to go into the detail. But, and if you expand this to close to the center, this is what you get in the end. So you have a potential, which is the trapping potential without uh, the other species, which is normalized by this quantity here, which is proportional to the density of the 
the, the derivative of the density with respect to the chemical potential. So which, which is some kind of, uh, of uh, compressibility of the, of the fermions. So here what we have is that the effective potential in which the bosons uh, live, evolve, is the trapping potential which is due to light, plus a correction which is due to the interactions with the, uh, with the fermions, which is just proportional to the uh, compressibility of the gas of fermions. And so uh, we could make this, the, the measurement, so these are the, the points here. Uh, there's the blue line which is there, that correspond to this prediction here. Uh, and where we used uh, some uh, known equation of set, as I told you, we, we have explored the, the BC to BCS crossover, and so we are able to measure the equation of state of these guys. It was calculated uh, using Monte Carlo simulations, and so we could plot uh, the solid line corresponding to this interaction here. And so you see that there's a uh, quite good agreement uh, between the experiment and theory, which means that we understand uh, pretty well uh, what's going on here. There's just small thing, so which is this triangle here. The triangle here corresponds to, uh, let's say, there, obviously there are different versions of the equation of state for the, the, the fermions, and uh, we think that for here, for the, the, the resonance where the, the, the interaction between fermions is infinite, um, we think that this is a prediction of the most accurate determination of the equation of state uh, of the, the Fermi gas. So there seems to be a small decrease moment. It's still inside the error bars, but there's an upward shift uh, with respect to, 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 to experiments here. And one uh, possibility, uh, one, exp one possible explanation for this discrepancy is uh, the fact that here we, we just assume that we're in uh, some weakly interacting regime and we just have some coupling which is proportional to the density of, uh, of the fermions. And uh, we, we tried with, uh, with Xavier to, uh, to explore what's going on when you try to go beyond the mean field approximation, what, uh, what happens when you uh, increase the strength of interactions in the, uh, in the system. And so what we found, so I will not go into the detail, but just to, to make a very long story short, uh, so we found that if you try to, to perform some kind of um, perturbative expansion for the equation of state of the, of the impurity, you find that the energy of the impurity is just so the mean field prediction plus a term which is proportional to the square of the interactions and this sum here that involves some compressibility of the, of the cloud, of the cloud of fermions. And uh, actually what happens is that this sum is divergent. And so we had to find a, a way to uh, regularize uh, this sum. And in, just like what I told you before, uh, in this problem we have this Fimov physics that pops up. And the way we found to, to, to solve uh, this problem, just like with uh, the Bose problem, is to introduce by hand uh, these three, three body interactions. And we, we could find some criteria for, um, to, uh, to, to, to make this uh, regularization procedure uh, possible, which is related to the way you have to describe the excitation of the fermions. But I don't, I don't have time to go into the detail. But in the end, what we find is that uh, the, the mean field correction that we, that we could calculate here are indeed compatible with this upward shift uh, that we observed in the experiment. So obviously, experimentally, it's not relevant yet because your bars are just of the same order as, uh, as the shift. But that's an interesting uh, uh, direction we would like to, to explore later. OK, uh, I think I'm at the end of my talk. Um, so uh, we'd just like uh, to conclude by showing you uh, once again this, uh, this fair diagram and to, uh, to stress uh, once again that what's really uh, the, 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 the main advantage of cold atoms is the, the richness of, of the physics which, are available, which is available to, to our experimental setups. Uh, so for the, the particle case of uh, this impurity problem, so the, the next goal is to understand better what happens when we increase the strength of the interactions. Uh, and uh, finally, also explore the, the role of uh, dimensionality uh, in our experiments, what happens in 1D, 2D, uh, and even there are some experiments in mixed dimensions, for instance, in the, in the, at Collège de France, uh, Rafael Lopez will explore what happens when you have particles that move in 2D uh, in presence of particles in 3D, etc. Thank you very much.